Hey guys, how's it going? As you may know, I've been working on a short series of illustrations featuring this little red polka dot bandana girl in various moments and medias. She's been on a gelato stand adventure in Italy, snuck a snack in a ballet studio, and enjoyed the company of friends at a slumber party. With each illustration, I've attempted to capture some soft, simple, yet magical moment in watercolors or markers, gouache, whatever medium was catching my fancy at the time. And today's illustration is bringing that short series to a finish. Though the process for this piece was a little bit more rushed than the others, more on that later, it was still such a joy to create and I'm so excited to share it with you. I'll also be announcing the winners of last week's giveaway at the end of the video. Make sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon to be notified of each Friday's new video, and without further ado, let's get into it. So I talk a lot on this channel about my passion for creating whimsical and nostalgic illustrations, and I think this piece in particular is really a stirring pot, pun intended, of some of the things that are most nostalgic and magical to me. I think there really is beauty and magic in every single moment, even the ones, if not especially the ones, that are maybe the most seemingly mundane. Taking the time to truly be in the moment is one of the most magical things in life to me. Magic isn't always about fairy dust and wild adventures, sometimes it's about finding the adventure in an everyday thing. So this piece started out with a few little sketches in my sketchbook. I wanted the bandana girl to have a very peaceful expression on her face as she's adding ingredients to her special soup. Maybe her favorite song is going through her head, or the smell of the soup is just mesmerizing. I want the people who look at my illustrations to see a little piece of themselves in it, and read between the lines whatever is speaking to them. Growing up, I spent a lot of time in the kitchen with my mom and my grandma, so it's a very nostalgic place for me. My grandparents have a small apple orchard, so making things like applesauce or pie or kolaches, look those up if you don't know what they are, they are freaking delicious. So I always love to help my mom cook dinner and cook goodies for our family, and honestly, food is one of the Lord's greatest gifts in my opinion, so any place it's made is very special to me. So I always like to pull from my own memories for my illustrations, but I also really like to add things that maybe are a little bit more unfamiliar to me. I've obviously never had a vintage stove, but I love the aesthetic of it. Something about the shape language in the curves and angles of old-fashioned items and appliances really speaks to me. I've also been looking at a lot of Montessori toys, specifically the wooden ones, and I love the raw, natural quality of them, and I also really like trying to incorporate those similar vibes in my own artwork. If you've watched literally any of my videos, you know that the backgrounds and the props are my favorite thing to draw and paint, so I really had a lot of fun exploring ideas for this scene. I recreated some canisters that my grandma has, added some potted plants for a touch of nature, whatever spoke to me while I was drawing it. Also, I wanted to add a little doggo laying on the floor because Ella loves to get under my feet when I'm in the kitchen. This was one that needed to be finalized digitally so I could move things around easier and create the right perspective for things. By the way, this line art is available as a coloring page this month on Patreon, so follow the link in the description to join in the fun. There's lots of little hidden details to discover while you color. So I knew from the beginning that this really did need to be an ink and watercolor piece. I could not wait to get my dip pen out and bring some life to all of these little elements. I won't lie, <laughs> I struggle to draw in a consistent style and give each of my illustrations a similar look, but honestly, I'm kind of okay with that. I try to listen to what each illustration is asking for and use mediums and aesthetics that best convey the emotion or mood that I'm trying to evoke. That's the amazing thing about art, is you get to make whatever you want, in whatever style you want, whatever medium you want, whatever you want to do, do it. Just do it! I think my illustrations are connected in their own way by the nostalgia and the whimsy in them, whether or not the medium or style is exactly the same. So anyways, I've bought a few brown inks in the past, but they just weren't really right for this particular illustration, so I bought the Dr. P.H. Martin's Van Dyke Brown Ink, which has a bit more of a red undertone, and honestly, it was totally worth it. I think it adds a more vintage quality. So after tracing the sketch with my lightbox, I brought out the dip pen. 
I think if I was a superhero, a dip pen would most definitely be my weapon. It's like Thor's hammer for me. It's so bold and fun to play with. I love inking. So I've been watching a lot of Cosmic Spectrum's videos on YouTube to see how she adds more texture and liveliness, I guess, to her pieces. One of her illustrations in particular, called The Scholar, uses lots of really fun pen techniques, and I think I watched the process video for it like eight times while I was inking this. Line art can look very stiff and uninteresting, and adding things like varied line weights or patching, even little speckles, creates more dimension and livens up the piece. Obviously the character is supposed to be the focal point of this piece, so I used the heaviest and most varied line weight on her. But I wanted each little element to be able to stand alone as well. Sure, I could have just thrown in a regular square toaster, but it wouldn't be overly interesting to look at. I always want every corner of my illustrations to be able to stand on their own and still be appealing. So after inking, I began laying down an underpainting. Once again, I shot myself in the foot with this. I used the same technique for underpainting this watercolor illustration that I do with my gouache illustrations, and it just does not really work the same. Gouache can be used as an opaque medium, so laying down the underpainting with all of the values I'm wanting to their darkest and lightest is fine, but because watercolor is a transparent medium, if I lay down a heavy, dark underpainting, even if that is the value that I'm wanting in the end, my watercolor gets very washed out and dulled. That reddish brown comes through every wash of watercolor I place on top of it. So because red is the complementary of green, when I laid down the green on the cabinets later, they cancelled each other out and made a very dull grayish green. And I knew as I was doing the underpainting that this was going to happen, but I still did it anyways. I don't know man, I'm just not bright sometimes. I do it to myself. Anyways, after the underpainting, it was time to go in with the watercolors. I had already designed a color comp digitally, so basically all I needed to do was recreate it. There wasn't really any guesswork involved. But because my family was getting ready to move my sister, the coloring part ended up being a little bit rushed. We were moving her on a Friday, so everything needed to be done by Thursday, including editing and putting out a new YouTube video. So needless to say, I was a little bit stressed. <laughs> And the mess I'd made for myself with the underpainting skyrocketed that stress to a whole new level. So yeah, that was great. The ink I used for the underpainting has some shellac in it, I think, so if you lay that on too heavy, the watercolor just won't soak into the paper at all, meaning it just kind of sits there and looks gross, which is annoying. I ended up having to bring in some markers later on because I just couldn't get a wash of watercolor to stay put on the page. It was a good lesson, but painful at the time. So I really wanted to add sun rays to create a bit more ambiance for the scene. I feel like sun rays kind of add, I don't know, a little bit of magic in a picture, and they can also help draw the eye where you want it to go. I exposed for the shadows, which means that all the light coming through the window would basically blow out all of the outdoor details. No trying to come up with an interesting window view, just a pale light yellow, and I called it done. Well, I guess I added a little hummingbird feed or two, just for fun, but even that's pretty washed out from the light rays. So I've talked a bit about wanting to do a Kickstarter for my Tom to Town prints, and I think my plan as of right now is to do that in either August or September. There is so much more that goes into Kickstarters than I realized, and I really want to make it as good as I can. I finally purchased... Anyways, I finally purchased a domain, so I'm also working on getting my new website up and running so I can start an email list. I really enjoy writing, and I'd love to send out a newsletter once or twice a month just to kind of catch people up on what projects I'm working on, any new products for sale, or just little fun things going on in art and life. Maybe some pictures of Ella, I don't know. <laughs> I am trying to make art my full-time career. And, you know, making money is a part of that, but at the heart of it, I'm just trying to use what God's given me for his glory and share the joy of art with anyone who wants to see it. 
Over the last few months, I've gotten some of the sweetest emails and DMs about my artwork, kind of inspiring people to rekindle a creative practice or bringing back a piece of nostalgia from childhood memories. If making art doesn't give me enough to live on, it's still enough for me that it makes a difference in someone else's life. So after noodling around with watercolors and trying not to pull my hair out a few times, it was time to bring in the colored pencils and gouache. And also the dip pen. The dip pen made a reappearance as well. I had had to lay on the watercolor so thick in some areas, especially on the cabinets, that it was actually covering up the line art entirely, so I wanted to bring back the lines and hatching to try to restore my sanity, to try to liven up the piece again. The painting was also dull in a lot of areas, and colored pencils were a time-saving way to bring more saturation in. The red of the bandana definitely needed to be brighter, and I wanted to add some more pops of color in the shadows throughout the piece. I did leave a few areas duller because they just didn't really need to draw attention to themselves. Like the boxes and such in the open cabinet and the jars in the open drawer didn't need a lot of variation or vibrancy in color because they'd be partially in shadow and they just aren't primary focal points. Someone on Instagram made a reference to the little dotty spotty bits I've been adding to a lot of my illustrations lately as being a part of my style and I guess I hadn't even really noticed that. I just love adding them and I think they bring some more magic to a piece. It's funny how styles kind of just evolve and creep up on you without you even realizing that's what it is. Style truly does take time to develop and it's not really something that you can force. Right now I'm kind of just exploring and figuring out what aesthetics and elements appeal to me and what I love to add to my own artwork. I'm absolutely fascinated by the soft realism in Annie Stegg's paintings and I even have several of her prints up on my walls, but that style of art isn't something I particularly enjoy doing myself. I guess it's not really all that different than enjoying the sound of an instrument, but not having the desire to learn how to play it. I'm discovering that it's okay to like and appreciate styles of art that don't really make an impact on your own. The artists that directly influence my art are more in the illustration field than in fine art. Artists like JC Leindecker, Norman Rockwell, Chris Hong, of course. <laughs> I always like to pull lots of different elements and techniques from them. I think it's all about what you're wanting to say with your artwork and finding, as the Draftsman podcast would call it, art parents to inform your work. Art school hasn't really been an option for me due to finances and health, and kind of recreating my own art school at home has most definitely been the right path for me. Speaking of which, if you're interested in me making a video about how I've kind of developed my own art school and curriculum, let me know down in the comments. I would love to talk about it. Spoiler alert, there's going to be a lot of books. So after adding some last little elements, the piece was finished. It was most definitely a struggle in some parts, but after leaving it to sit for a couple weeks, I really do like it, I think. <laughs> and I said what I wanted to with it, so I guess that's the most important part. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed watching the process behind this piece. And if you're interested in adopting some originals, prints, or stickers, follow the link in the description to my Etsy shop. 
I just added some new items, and once some of the older items are gone, I'll be adding prints of this series to my shop as well. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next Friday. Bye guys!